It is um, May the 3rd, Victoria Peak, 1023 in the morning, and we're here with Oren Swearingen, the most famous of the Spelunkers. He's going to tell us a story about uh, Victoria Peak. Oren, why don't you tell me how you first found out about uh, this whole Victoria Peak? Where were you? Where were you stationed? At the time I was in dental school, in Dallas, Baylor Dental School, I was halfway through 1954. And a friend and I had become interested in cave exploring. And uh, one day, one weekend, we were in town in Dallas, downtown Dallas, just window shopping, passed by a hardware store that had a used metal detector in the window for sale. So we went in and Inquired of the cost of the metal detector from the proprietor, whose name was Emmanuel F. Chandler. And he was an elderly man and kind of a colorful character and reminded me of my grandfather, so I instantly took a liking to him. And we visited for some time and we came back on another occasion and talked to him some more. And he took a liking to us. And uh, he began to relate treasure stories to us, since we were interested in treasures and looking at the detector. And uh, as we visited more and more with him and, get, and gained his confidence, he told us more and more stories. One of the stories he told was about Victoria Peak. And the reason that he knew about the peak was that a few years prior to this, he had become partners with Violet Noss, at that time was Violet Yancey, married to Roy Yancey in Fort Worth. She had formerly been married to Doc Noss. And after his death, uh, she tried to recruit some men to help her form a company to come back out here. I don't know what they intended to do, but Roy was lifelong friends with a man named Carol Milliken. And when Roy married Violet, uh, she told Roy about the treasure story and, and Roy told Carol, and Carol knew Manuel. Evidently, they had done some treasure hunting together on some occasion. And since Manuel had a little money to operate with, uh, he brought them together, thinking that Manuel could help Violet. And so Violet turned over whatever documents and records that she had, that she had fallen heir, heir to from Doc, and allowed him to have them or have uh, make copies of them. Uh, and he showed those to me. The only thing he didn't show to me was a copy of a map that Doc was reported to have taken out of the cave that was drawn by Padre LaRue and dated somewhere in the area of 1767 or in that neighborhood. I can't remember the exact date. Manuel talked about this map quite often in the it was inconvenient to show it to me because it was in a safety deposit box in the downtown bank, Mercantile National Bank. And it's always someday. Someday we'll, we'll go downtown and I'll show it to you. And so I was curious to see it, so I was always after him about it. When are we going to go? And eventually we finally did go. We opened the, the box and took it out and looked at it. And uh, it was not the original parchment, but it was a photostatic copy of the original. The original was still in Violet's possession. And it, the photostat showed uh, a, a weathered and obviously aged and somewhat tattered document. About, I'm going to try to remember, not quite two feet wide and about the same height, 18 inches to two feet, somewhere in that pretty good size piece of paper. And the whole left-hand side of it was covered in, in writing, Spanish writing, from a beautiful handwriting style, very ornate, or whatever, the swirls and flowering, the way they used to write in, in ancient times. And not knowing Spanish, of course, I couldn't read what it said, neither could he. 
but they were so secretive about the thing that they wouldn't dare take it to anyone to be translated. And uh, I couldn't make out what it was talking about. It could have been a history of uh, the operation of the mining. It could have been an inventory of what was stored in the cave, or it could have been directions on how to get into the cave. It could have been all three. I don't know. The only thing I could make out was at the bottom of the page was the date and his name, Maru. The right half of the page showed a uh, diagram or a sketch drawing of the peak itself and showed the approximate entrance location and showed the course of the caves that went inside and the direction that it ran, which was considerable length and it was uh, running south. The entrance originated on the northeast quadrant and roughly halfway up the mountain. We looked at it for just a few minutes. He wouldn't allow me to make any copies of it or take notes or anything, even though I asked him. Uh, he was in a hurry, going back to the store. He operated a hardware store, which was uh, both new and new equipment. So that's the extent of my viewing of that map. Uh, the other documents he had were drawings of uh, the peak two and, and uh, this chart, or Derritero, they call it, uh, that began to ask in El Paso del Norte where the Caballo Mountains are, and they're four days ride north, you know, that old, that thing in Spanish supposed to have come from the peak too and he had that and I've studied that and he and I went out on many many excursions on other treasure stories he knew a thousand of them he loved to talk and uh, he wore baggy khaki trousers with suspenders and kind of a checkered shirt and pot belly you know the kind of pants kind of hung down and had a, always had a pipe hanging out of his mouth, which sometimes as he was talking would fall to the floor, and kind of white, gray to white hair. This reminded me a lot of my grandfather. I really was attached to him. He had one son who was college age, uh, had him late in life apparently. And during that time frame, um, he and his son were digging a water well in the backyard of their home. And bringing the pipe out of the ground, they hit a high tension wire and were both electrocuted. The son was killed. And Manuel probably was dead for a period. Uh, because later he related to me uh, one of these so called after death experiences. He described it tearfully. And I believe it. His, his feet were black, and his shoes were blown off of his feet holes in the sole of the shoes and uh, he said that when that happened he, he so he floated up above his body and looked down and could see his body and his son's body laying there on the ground anyway we became very close and uh, so I, I made one trip out here with Carol Milliken to see the place and we drove out into the desert uh, we went past the windmill, first windmill that you that you pass when you leave town, Rincon. We came all, always came through Rincon. It was the only road available back then, really. No freeway at that time. And we had to, to drive out of Rincon, uh, across the railroad tracks, and down into the riverbed, which is very sandy because it's soft. Follow the riverbed up about a half a mile, three quarters of a mile, and then come out of the river bank switch back up on the side of a little plateau until he got to the, the top of it, the desert. And he said that uh, Doc had buried some bars near that windmill, and the day after Doc was killed, the Violet came back to the windmill to, to retrieve the bars and found a freshly dug hole, and they were gone, and she never knew what happened to them. I didn't know either until many years later what had happened to them, and Tony Jolly's involvement. That came later. And uh, we drove in part of the way, and then the car that he had was not a four-wheel drive, and we got stuck in the sand. Uh, the roads weren't maintained back in those days. And a lot of drift sand would blow in, very fine powdery sand. It would be deep, and it would 
run for long distances and would bog your car down. So after getting stuck two or three times, we gave up, got out of there, and went on back to Dallas. It was about the next year, uh, 1955, that I came back with two or three of my friends from dental school in the summer, and we came in here and looked around. And so uh, the next year was when I graduated from dental school, and at that time, there was a law in the books that everyone had to serve two years of compulsory military service. And during the uh, time in school, the Korean War had been going on. I'd been deferred because of being in school. And uh, there's always a chance of another war breaking out, so I decided the best thing for me to do would be to go into the service immediately upon graduation, rather than risk setting up an office and practice and then being pulled out and go in. So um, I applied for, for duty in the Army. Really, the service was fairly full at that time. They didn't really need anyone, and so I had to pull a few strings to get in. And I was assigned uh, to Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio, for orientation for six weeks. And then from there, you're assigned to your duty base, wherever it may be. And at the end of that six weeks, they published on the bulletin board a list of all the bases around the world that had openings in their dental clinic. And I looked on the list, and it just happened, coincidentally, that White Sands had an opening. It was on the board. All the other guys were choosing the exotic places like Germany or Japan and going there. And I applied for White Sands. No one else did, so I, by default, received that assignment. And I did that specifically in order to be out here and search for the, the treasure of Doc Noss. I arrived here in November of 56, and it took me a couple of months in order to accumulate enough money to buy a Jeep. The first trip out here, I, I rented a Jeep and uh, checked out sleeping bags from the base. My dental assistant at that time was a uh, corporal. Uh, I don't know what to call him today, E2 or 3 or something. But the name of Jim Lockhart. And uh, he got the Jeep for me and he got the uh, camping equipment and the bed rolls and we came out here. We camped at what later became known as Hellside. And the weather was pleasant when we came out that evening and set up our camp. And during the night, it snowed on us. We woke up with two inches of snow on top of our bedrooms. And then we came in and we prowled around on them. We weren't really sure which was Victoria Peak, whether it was this one or whether Geronimo over there was Victoria Peak. We really didn't know for sure. So we just kind of scouted generally all around, exploring. And then in a couple of months, uh, I bought a Jeep and began to make regular trips. In the course of my activities at the dental clinic, one of my patients was a lieutenant colonel who was the uh, provost marshal, and his name was Wells. I think it was Howard Wells. And one day while I was working on him, I told him about this place that I was interested in coming up and looking around and poking around, and he said, perfectly all right. Just don't touch any ordnance, unexploded ammunition or anything that you might see. And don't photograph any military installation. Other than that, you have free run. And if anyone, uh, any of the guards, the range riders happen to see you or catch you, just tell them to call me and I'll authorize it. And by coincidence, uh, later I had another patient who was uh, Colonel Dollar, who was at that time chief of the Range Riders. He was the head of that organization. What, what year? This was uh, either before or after Christmas, I don't remember, in 56. It might have been the early months of uh, 57. It was about the time I got the G. And Colonel Dollar said, same thing. He said, uh, if any of my range riders catch you, tell them just to call me. I'll tell them it's all right. Just go up there and do whatever you want. So it was very quiet up here at that time. There wasn't much activity. Uh, the story was known, but not 
like later. And so Carol had related to me, Carol Milliken had related to me uh, the story of Violet going into one of the caves here on the peak that Doc showed them on one occasion and that the that particular cave was an entrance, uh, a way in to the cavern where the gold was. Not that it was open and accessible, but that it was a possible avenue to it. And so she described what it should look like, what the entrance would look like, what it would look like inside. And so uh, I knew the story about the dynamite blast in the upper north shaft, and I knew there would be no way of getting in that route. So I was trying to find Violet's alternate route. And in the process of doing that, I covered everything that I could see on the mountain that had an opening and would go into them just enough to, to verify whether it was the one that Violet had described. Um, Soldier's Hole, I looked in, both the upper and lower entrance to it, and just discovered quickly that that wasn't the right cave. I came down to this spot here, this outcropping with this juniper tree. It looked like a likely place for there to be an entrance. Didn't actually see one. Uh, depending on what story you believe, this is one of the places that Tom Burlett claims was their entrance. Uh, somewhere in this outcropping. And on another occasion, he said they went into soldiers' homes. So who knows? Uh, the mule entrance was very inviting, tempting, uh, such a huge portal, imposing, but it didn't look like Violet's Cave. On the other side of the mountain is a thing we call split rock. It's two rocks that lean into each other and make an archway. It has a beautiful appearance of a cave portal, but it didn't match Violet's description. I went in the top. Uh, down docks, original chimney shafts on rope and ladder. Went into the lower knob shaft, explored that. Everything that was open that I could get into, I checked. Somewhere in the process of doing that, I found this hole up above us. You couldn't see it until you walked right up on it. And it was just a round hole in the ground, went straight down. Looked like a, about the size of a 55 gallon drum buried all the way to the top in the ground. It looked like a dead end. You couldn't see any way out of it. But I dropped down into it, and sure enough, when I got down and leaned way down, there was a, a slot on one side, just big enough to slide in, feet first. Uh, it was a very dangerous looking place because the rocks were very loose. There were some grass and weeds growing in there, or else it walked in, or whatever. Uh, no visibility, you couldn't see what was in front of you. If there was, if was a snake in there, he would be in your hip pocket before you knew it. And there would be no way to move to get out of his way. It was a tight fit on, on the sides as well as the top and bottom. You would slide in until your full body length and a little bit more, maybe two or three feet beyond that. Say a, t a total of eight or nine feet. And then you could immediately sit up and stand up. When you did, you were standing, you found yourself on a ledge, and you're looking not only into the room, but looking down into the room. The floor was all roughly six feet or seven below you. And leaning up against the ledge over here was a log with notches cut in it. It could be used as a stepladder. Um, it might roll, but you could use it. But right out in front, the, the distance of one long stretch with your legs, you could step across onto this boulder, which was at least six feet tall and six or eight feet wide and only uh, four or five feet across it. And on the other side of that boulder, the ground wasn't so far down. It was a little higher up and it had a rough surface so you could kind of climb down on it more easily. So usually that's the way I went. I would step across onto that boulder and go down the opposite side of it, lower myself to the floor, and it, when you do that, you're in the middle of a roughly circular room and with an arching ceiling, which 
I would estimate to be roughly the height of the dome room in Soldier's Hall, something around 16, 18 feet high at least, maybe more. And the room would be 25 to 30 feet uh, in diameter in any direction. And the as you went out in the center of this room and you look to your left, you would see a vertical fissure in, in the wall, a crack in the wall, where the rock had pulled apart something in the order of uh, 9 or 10 inches. Not enough for a person to slip through it. And shining my light into that fissure, which was vertical, I could see horizontally more than 100 feet. And then there's a, a slight curvature to the fissure. It's not perfectly straight. But there's enough curvature that in the distance of about 100 feet, it, it would round the bend and you couldn't see any further. And then down vertically, it was the same thing, at least 100 feet down. And when it finally would go around the curve, you couldn't see any more. And I would take rocks and drop them down in there, and I would listen for them to ricochet off the sides. And they keep ricocheting until you couldn't hear them anymore, because you could never hear it hit bottom. Then on the opposite wall, that fault continued through the room. Why there wasn't a crack in the floor, I don't know. I said it had been artificially bridged. But over here on the right wall, which would be uh, north-westerly, the uh, fissure continued, but not as far in horizontal distance as this one did to the left, but it had the same vertical depth to it. Also, two, the wall's too close together to be able to get, it, get into it. And then, turning back to the front again, and proceeding the, in the general course of the tunnel itself, which was, what would that be? Southwest, I suppose. More, more southerly, south-southwest. Pretty much at right angles to the dike. So it would have to be a little bit west and south. Straight away, uh, when, you, when you exit the round room, you have to step down a little bit. Two or three steps. And then you're in a tunnel. And the tunnel is descending at a gentle angle, and the walls are about the width of your arms that you could touch both sides. And the ceiling is up probably six or eight feet or, or so, maybe more, in the beginning. And as you walk along down this ramp-like tunnel, the walls slowly begin to converge, and the ceiling slowly starts coming down, too, until you reach the end of it, which if I can remember, I never measured it, but if I can remember roughly looking at it in my mind's eye, 60 feet or so, you've finally terminated in a room so small that you couldn't stand up in it and to kind of lean forward, probably about a five foot ceiling. Did you uh, think it was natural? Uh, whether it's natural or not would be hard to say. Uh, when I was exploring it, all the many times that I was in there, I never really studied it from that standpoint, trying to determine whether it was a natural thing or man-made. All I knew was it was the route to the uh, treasure cave because it fit Dalit's description perfectly. So at the end of that room, and not in a direct line with the path you'd been walking, but off a little side place here, to the right. There was a hole in the floor, nearly perfectly round, like a well, and it went straight down. And uh, it had rocks in it. I could lay on my stomach and reach down and get a hold of the first rock. And it was too heavy to lift, only with arms. The rocks were probably two or three hundred pounds. And there was a rock, and then there was a rock under it, and then there was a rock under that. It was like, uh, very similar to if you have a, a tube and you want to drop some quarters into it to fill it up, and you drop your quarters in, they don't fall flat. They're in there at an angle. And you drop another quarter, and it doesn't fall flat either. You drop another quarter, and it's at a different angle. If you shake them, maybe you can get them to fall flat, but these rocks were in that shaft that way. 
they were dropped in, they wedged in some position, and then another rock was dropped, and they wedged in another angle, and another one was dropped. No dirt, just just rocks, about the size of the hole, to fit kind of tightly in the hole. And uh, even so, I could lay on my stomach and shine my flashlight and see an estimated 40 feet down before there was a rock that was just right in my way and I couldn't see beyond it. But I could see there was space below it. So the thing continued to go. Uh, there was enough gaps between the rocks that um, an animal, a monkey, or something that size could work its way down. A man couldn't, but a small animal could. And all of that fit what I had been told by Carol Milliken secondhand from Violet. And so I always, when I came back on many, many occasions in 1957 and early in 58, probably 40 or 50 times, and often alone and, and frequently accompanied by my dental assistant or someone else, and I'd always go in there, and we would always talk about what lay below and what possible ways there might be to be able to get to it, what equipment would be necessary, and all these things. And none of these things we could do. We, we couldn't uh, obtain the equipment to do it. We didn't have the time, didn't have the money, didn't have permission. It was inaccessible, but very enticing. In about uh, this time of year, about April, May of 58, my wife was uh, expecting our first child in June, and I sold my Jeep and used the money to buy her a little diamond necklace as a gift for the baby, for having the baby. And so I stopped coming to the peak in the summer of 58. That coincidentally is the time that Figi and Berlitt began to come out and search. And according to their story, they worked all summer long for three months. Somewhere underneath this rocky outcropping here, where we are, uh, widening a, a gopher hole until it became somewhat of a tunnel, and followed it, in, trending in the general direction of Soldier's Hole. And after three months, they claimed they broke into a room that had 400 bars stacked in it. A small room, not the kind of room Dr. Noss described. About 10 foot by 12 foot room. And then a smaller adjoining room that had 300 bars stacked in it. A total of 700 roughly, they estimated. Whether that's true or not remains to be seen. But uh, that's about the time that I got out of the Army. Uh, we had our baby in June, June the 6th. We got uh, discharged 1st of October. We left the area. I went to Dallas, where I'd gone to school, opened an office there for a year. And uh, our child was uh, kind of sickly with the, because of the humidity where we were living. The doctor recommended the drier climate, so we moved back to El Paso in 61. Um, again, it was in the fall, and uh, in the spring of 62, I bought a International Scout, which was a new type of vehicle that just came out and began to, re to return to this area. I came back many times. Um, I came back and went into the, the cave often. It was the same as I left it, undisturbed, except on one occasion I found a wooden box in there and a homemade rope ladder that someone had left. I was a little bit annoyed that somebody, some stranger, was messing around in my cave, and so I removed the rope ladder. Found out later who had put it there. Accidentally found it out. I was reading some correspondence from the Freedom of Information Act. My name was Twitchell. I tried to contact him to tell him that I had taken out his rope ladder, but he wouldn't answer my letter for the phone call. I brought a lot of people out here with me, many occasions. I didn't really want to come along, but sometimes I had to, because other people couldn't take off. I stopped coming 
when the Gaddis Mining Company began their work. I stayed away for a while. And then after uh, the Gaddis operation was over with, a friend wanted to see the place. He'd heard me talk about it. And I brought him out here. I tried to show him uh, Violet's Cave. Couldn't find it. The Army had covered it, or Gaddis had covered it. Somebody covered it about that same time. I didn't know where the Gaddis Tunnel was. We began to widen our search area, thinking maybe I was wrong about exactly where the spot was, and we, uh, in the process of doing that, ranged a little bit further to the left, south, and we found a place that looked like it had been covered. And we worked for about two hours, Bill Nichols and I, and we removed some rocks and finally found it was a hole there. I came down to the scout where it was parked at the top of the old Moss Road where I always parked to get some lights and some rope to explore the cave. When I did, I heard a voice behind me saying, don't move, and I turned around and it was a range rider. And we were apprehended and we were interrogated at great length. And we're not able to explore the tunnel. We had to leave. Out here and went into the cave and explored it. We found dynamite in it, we found shoring in it, we found a wooden hopper hanging from the ceiling, and we thought mistakenly that it was a Gaddis tunnel. And we knew that the Gaddis company didn't find the treasure cave, and so we felt like we were wasting our time exploring that place, and so we left. We found out later that that wasn't the Gaddis tunnel. Now it's a mystery as to what tunnel it was entrance to it has since been covered. We can't relocate it yet. Uh, there is, uh, in the county records, the existence of a lead mine on this mountain back at the turn of the century, 1900s. It was called Artemisa. Possibly that's what that was. Later on I found out where the Gaddis Tunnel really was and explored that. Sports Soldiers Hole was led to believe that a person, a friend of mine, had seen gold in a room from a side tunnel leading out of the dome room. The dome room was filled with rubble and dirt and rock. We couldn't prove or disprove his story. So we began a about an 18-month campaign to clean out the dome room. It was tedious work, there was no ventilation in the tunnel, the room would fill with dust, it would be impossible to see. We continued working, there was, we uncovered a huge boulder in the middle of the room that apparently had dropped out of the ceiling, probably creating the dome shape. But when it first started it was covered by dirt, you didn't even know it was there, but the thing was the size of a Volkswagen. And then we began digging out around the sides of it and underneath it, which is very dangerous and precarious. We tried to shore it up some. So we would have to crawl down underneath this thing and get a bucket of dirt and then pass it back along the length of our body to the person behind us and he would carry it out into the thing we call the hallway and dump it. Very slow and tedious. Finally, we magically pulled out one rock. It was a key rock. And what we did was like pulling the plug. And all the dirt in the dorm room began to flow towards that hole. And Eureka, all of a sudden the room was clean. Everything had gone down below, exposing a, a hole in the floor in a, in a room deeper below us. So we got rope and, and went down into it and found out that was the, the ring room, the famous ring room in the Gaddis Tunnel. So named because of rods that had been driven into the walls and bent back into a loop to run cable through. And of course that was collapsed. There was no way in or out of there except the way we had come in through soldiers. But as we cleaned out this room and exposed the right hand or north wall of the dome room, we saw that there was no side tunnel, no side passage, no room with gold in it. We'd been lied to. And we'd spend a lot of work and a lot of time for nothing.
From time to time in the uh, 70s, I would come out here on occasion. Uh, usually when someone would ask me about the place and want to know and see it, I'd bring them. Several times I tried to stop coming and something always would happen and I would be brought back out. And this continued until the uh, about the year 79, 80, 81. Um, that's when I stopped working in, in Soldier's Hole. I was trying to, to open up a chimney that led up out of the ring room towards the surface. I was hoping to establish an easier way in and out. And when I found out that I'd been lied to about the gold in the dome room, I stopped trying to open up that chimney and I stopped coming out. And then uh, in 1984, I left the area, moved uh, my practice away from El Paso to East Texas, where I now live, College Station. That was precipitated by the peso devaluation and the slumping economy along the border. And I thought that I had seen Victoria Peak for the last time in 1984-85. And several years went by, three or four years went by, and then one day I received a telephone call from Norman Scott and he said he wanted to set up a time to meet with me, to interview me that the Noss family had, had, had sent him to interview people that might be help, helpful, or might have knowledge or, or something about the peak because the family was organizing, or trying to organize an expedition to come in here. And they were trying to gather to themselves anybody who could be of benefit or help to them. And he wanted to know what I knew and whether I knew enough to be beneficial to the family. And so he wanted to make an appointment. I told him to come anytime. So he flew from Florida to the College Station Airport. I went out and picked him up. He stayed at my house for a couple of days. We talked at great length. I showed him a lot of my photographs, movie film, uh, notebooks that I'd kept about the peak and the end result was I suppose that he called uh, Terry Delonis or someone in the family and told them that he thought I had a, enough knowledge about the mountain that I should be uh, able to be helpful to the family and that, that we should get together. So sometime after that it was arranged that I would fly to Albuquerque and meet with Terry and others of the family, which I did. I don't remember what year that was. It's been about four or five years ago. This is 1993. And I've been involved with the family ever since in this project. Uh, I've tried to relay every scrap of information that I have about the peak or the, in the basin to the family to, to help them achieve their objectives. I hope that something of what I've been able to, to bring to the group has been helpful.